first uh, talk I've done outside of the UK, which is very exciting. It's also, it's also the first talk I've done in slippers, which is also very exciting. Um, so yeah, so yeah, my name's Charlie and uh, I co-founded uh, the group Future Architects Front. And if you have come across us before, it's probably through one of these two mediums, either the Instagram page or the Twitter account. And that is primarily the way that we sort of operate and interact with people, and that, that is, um, at the moment, our main sort of platform and, and way of doing things. And <clears throat> this has kind of made it hard for us to figure out like what it is or what, like, what we would call that in terms of the kind of organization it is. And normally when someone would ask us that question, I would get out of it by just saying yes, like whatever you want to call it, yes, we're that. But more recently, I think I've started to have uh, a kind of better idea, like a better, more, more clarity on what you know, FAP actually does. And it shifted from thinking about it as <clears throat> a contemporary form of political engagement within architecture, and that's become, as we've understood our work better, a contemporary form of political engagement through architecture. And that probably seems like a very slight semantic difference in English as well, so I understand there's probably an extra barrier there. But I'm gonna try and, through this talk, elaborate on what the difference between these two um, is, so what it means to operate politically within, and what it means to operate politically through architecture. So, <clears throat> why, like, why does FAF exist? Why do we do any of these things? Well, the main reason is probably that everyone in this room right now probably feels currently, or has felt, like this. So, this is a good sort of, uh, in my opinion, this is one of the best images to capture what it means to be alive in 2023 right now, especially as a young person. Uh, the world is on fire, everything seems to be reaching a point of uh, extreme crisis, and we just kind of have to be like, well, time to make another render. But, you know, that, it, it's a bizarre situation to be in, and it's something that hopefully we can actually start to address rather than just kind of carrying on as normal. So a really good example of, you know, this kind of crisis situation in the UK is like in the UK our political system. So I don't know how up to date you are on UK politics, but if you had, you know, missed the fact that we had this prime minister for about two weeks, I wouldn't blame you because uh, we had a prime minister that lasted less time than it took for this lettuce to go bad. So the political situation in the UK right now is quite hilariously bad. Um, and this obviously is a condition that you can see across the world, you know, from uh, like Donald Trump to Bolsonaro to uh, our lettuce prime minister. And um, it's easy, I think, to believe that everything has gone bad very recently. But if we look at, you know, the actual data of some of the defining factors of what it means to live today, we can see that actually things have been getting worse for a long time. And this, I think, is one of the most important, you know, graphs that can capture that sort of condition. And it compares productivity with remuneration uh, for work. And you can see that for most of the 20th century, the more productivity there was, the better people were compensated. So your salary, you do, you do more work, you produce more, you get paid in line with that. But in the 80s, at the um, sort of emergence of neoliberal governance, uh, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, we start to see a decoupling of productivity and compensation. So we essentially see that since the 80s, in real terms, wages have stagnated, even though we've continued to produce more, you know, within architecture, we've gone from 
patent drafting to AutoCAD to BIM and like all of these all of these stages that have made us vastly more productive as workers and yet <clears throat> architects like all other workers have seen their salaries stagnate despite this increase of productivity. And I think one way of understanding why this stagnation has happened, uh, we can get a better understanding of that by overlaying information about unions onto that graph. So you can see that during the time that productivity and compensation rose together, there's strong union membership. So the labor movement is quite strong. Um, workers have a lot of leverage over uh, you know, their conditions and their pay and their terms. And then, you know, as productivity continues to increase, as we get neoliberalism, uh, and as we get the sort of uh, Thatcherite war against the unions, things like that, union membership begins to fall, and around the same time, our sort of pay and salaries begin to stagnate. Obviously, you know, there's a it's a there's, it's a much more complicated picture than this, but it's hard not to um, notice the relationship between these things and understand them as significant factors, if not necessarily the entire picture. We also have to contextualize the work that we do right now in terms of climate and environment. So this. Um, graph shows how GDP has changed over a similar sort of time period uh, and how this relates to both carbon emissions and material extraction, which is sort of the more lesser spoken of aspect of um, you know the ecological crisis that is spoken less about but still incredibly important. And you can see that. GDP is essentially coupled with carbon emissions and material extraction. And right now, every uh, sort of Western capitalist economy is based on the idea that GDP has to continue to rise, we have to keep producing more and more and more every year. And effectively, this is economically putting us on a sort of um, self-destruction course in terms of the way that this continually rising GDP will continue to produce more carbon and extract more materials. So this this is sort of like you know the actual data behind this feeling, right? Like this is so it's not something recent, it's something that we've been on course for for a very, very long time, and we're just starting to sort of see the absolute crisis points of um, this decades-long uh, process of uh, neoliberalism. So, if that's the context, if, if the house is on fire, why is it so rare for architects to engage politically? You know, why is an, ex an exhibition like this so, like, unusual and noteworthy? Well, uh, another way that we can see architects' political apathy is um, turnout for institutional uh, elections within the profession. So, if you don't know, Reba, Royal Institute of British Architects, is the largest membership body of architects in the UK. They are not the regulator. Uh, the regulator is the Architects Registration Board, but the REBA has long been the largest uh, membership body of architects uh, for over a century. So they still have a lot of um, kind of political, well, they, have, they have a lot of institutional weight despite the fact that they don't directly regulate the profession. And so, <clears throat> despite the fact that, you know, Reaper is potentially this fairly politically influential uh, organization, it has a lot of, yeah, like I said, organizational weight behind it, turnout for elections of Reaper council members and Reaper president are historically very, very low. So for a council election, it's as low as 9.6. For president elections, it's usually around 13%. So architects generally in the UK are very disengaged from the idea of sort of 
pushing forward a lobbying group or pushing forward a sort of political position beyond their work. One reason for why this might be is this report into um, you know, so-called elite occupations in the UK economy. And it found that of a number of different professions, architecture and town planning is actually the most privileged. Privileged here being defined as having uh, one or more parents in managerial uh, positions. And uh, according to that criteria, architecture came out on top as the, um, the most privileged. So we can maybe understand that some of this political apathy comes from uh, you know, being sheltered from some of these effects of uh, you know, climate, poor compensation, things like that, even though you know, now that's starting to change, now that um, things like rent prices, uh, low pay are now starting to affect not just the working class, but also the middle classes, which is why we're maybe starting to see more um, oxygen and attention given to this issue. Another really important factor in the UK is that in uh, the 70s, about half of all architectural work was done as part of the public sector. So it was publicly, it was public money uh, done for things like housing, public space, public parks, um, things that were publicly funded. Whereas as part of that process of neoliberalism, uh, that we spoke about earlier as part of um, Margaret Thatcher's 11 year war against local councils, money for such public projects sort of evaporated. Um, and the long-term effect of that is that in 2017, the, that 49% that of work that used to be in the public sector is now less than 1%. So the entire profession of architecture in the UK has effectively become privatized. So you can also see how the sort of political um, consciousness of architects has also been severed through the work that we do. So we went from doing work that was absolutely fundamentally political in the sense that it's publicly funded to being uh, almost entirely privately funded. And uh, just as a bit of more context, you can also see um, that decline in public work in this graph here. So you can see that in the 80s, at that uh, time of Thatcher's government, neoliberalism, public corporations took a nosedive, and that would have been where most of the publicly funded architectural work took place. Um, and then, in terms of more recent political movement, you can also see how uh, local government funding has dropped significantly, and central government funding has risen. Uh, as around the period of David Cameron on austerity in the UK, and Again, it kind of shows the continued process of um, these policies, these neoliberal policies, to today, where uh, even after public corporations were sort of decimated, we are still kind of going further and further into this very centralized, top-down uh, style of government. So, what what what, what can we do about it? Um, what why is it even worth thinking about this? Well. Within architecture, I think there's two articles that uh, sum up some of the most important um, sort of barriers to overcome in how we think about our role within the political economy. And one uh, is summarized incredibly well by uh, Death to the Calling uh, by Marissa Fulbright, who um, is the author of the book uh, over on that table over there. And to sort of summarize the argument of this piece, uh, she essentially looks into the way that architecture for many people in the profession is not treated as work or labor, it's treated as a calling, something that is almost like higher than ourselves, it's like spiritual, it's almost religious, it's something that you know we were born to do. Um, and in that way, we, Kind of make ourselves more vulnerable to exploitation and to depoliticize the work that we do because it's not seen as labor it's seen as um you know something like higher than that something like special and protected that can't be interrogated on the same terms as labor once 
we had kind of <clears throat> deal with this once we get to the point where we realize, you know, architectural work is labor, it is work, um, and it's inherently political. I think the next really important thing for architects to, as a culture, start to digest is this other article by Leia Hanrahan, uh, which is all design is political, but not all politics is design. So another sort of fairly significant problem that we face, I think, as a profession is that even politically active architects often see politics as like another design project. So, you know, the climate crisis, for example, is a design opportunity. Like think about sort of, you know, Bjork Engels trying to solve the climate crisis, right? Like that's, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about where, you know, a floating city is not the thing that's going to solve the climate crisis. So understanding that though design practice is political and it's important to be aware of that, we also need to understand that if we want to be um, contributing to a sort of progressive uh, political economic direction, we need to go beyond design practice and look at how we can organize as sort of political entities, as workers, um, and as organizers beyond architecture. So coming back to FAF, the way that a lot of this kind of manifests through what we do is um, through, you know, the sort of condition of um, social media and the digital landscape that, you know, has only really existed for maybe the last five or so years. And it's meant that for, uh, for architectural workers and people in the profession, you know, that kind of operated as a bit of a confession box where people could share their experience of working in the profession, share what they thought was not working or um, broken in the profession. And we, you know, share these messages anonymously, and it kind of becomes a continually ongoing um, dialogue around issues from unpaid overtime to maternity leave to um, exploitative conditions of construction workers. Um, absolutely everything can kind of be channeled through this sort of semi-public discussion uh, format. And using this, we also try and go beyond social media into, I guess, what people, particularly older people, would consider to be like legitimate mediums. So the first thing we ever did was uh, we wrote an open letter to the Royal Institute of British Architects, which um, summarized a lot of the research that we had done from a survey about the profession to people sharing experiences. The sort of epilogue to this open letter was 120 written experiences of people working in architectural practice that painted a very grim picture of the profession. And essentially, uh, this letter and these experiences allowed us to sort of distill five demands of what we thought the Royal Institute of British Architects should be doing. Um, and to sort of continue on this uh, this particular campaign that we ran, this open letter ended up receiving over 1,800 signatures, um, despite the fact that this was the first campaign we'd ever run. So we, we had no audience at this point. We, you know, never given a lecture, never written an article at this point, but the letter resonated with enough people that it got this kind of shocking number of signatures. That led us to a series of meetings with uh, the Royal Institute of British Architects where they agreed to do things like ban unpaid overtime in their practices um, and establish better support uh, and representation for young architectural workers. But as institutions are sort of often likely to do, they fell through on a lot of those promises, almost all of those promises. And so we sort of decided that the next step was if the institution um, wasn't going to, you know, work to represent architectural workers, then we would uh, make a new institution.
constitution by uh, trying to swing the next Reba presidential election. So we launched an open call uh, which uh, essentially invited anyone who fit a certain criteria that we laid out to put themselves forward to be our sort of nominee for the next Reba president. So we said the they had to be an architectural worker rather than an employer. They had to be, uh, you know, committed to sort of pursuing climate action, equity, things like this. And if they met this criteria, then they could stand for a sort of micro-election that we ran alongside UPW saw the Architects Union, the Architect Climate Action Network, and a group uh, of people who had used to work in Reba student representatives. So through this kind of like collaborative mini election, a guy called uh, Moiwa Oki won the, the election we ran. And so he then became the candidate that we supported in the actual Reba election. And to cut a long story short, he won. <laughs> so we're now in a position where, for the first time ever, the Reba president is not an employer, he's not the head of the practice. He is uh, a worker. He is the youngest uh, Reaper president ever. He's the first black Reaper president. So through this kind of grassroots campaign, um, you know, Moyo's been able to break a lot of um, you know first ever barriers, and we are starting to maybe see an avenue through which we can start to actually leverage these regressive institutions. Um, in quite a powerful way. We had a similar sort of campaign with the Architects Registration Board, and so, you know, if, if Reba is this big influential membership body in the UK, uh, the ALB is the actual regulator of architects, so they don't have, you know, they don't lobby for policies in the way that Reba does because they're a, essentially a sort of governmental body. Um, so the ARB, one of their responsibilities is deciding how you become an architect, how you get the title of architect, and that involves the way that you are educated. So at the moment, to become an architect in the UK, you have to do a three-year <coughs> undergraduate degree, you have to work for a year in practice, you have to do a two-year master's, you have to work for another year in practice, and then you have to do something called part three, which is um, a case study of a project you worked on, uh, an exam in things like management, practice, and law, and an interview with the ARB. And then after that process, which can take seven to 10 years, then you become an architect. But unlike in Czech Republic, where I understand you get a stamp once you're qualified and you actually are allowed to approve drawings and things like that. In the UK, there's no protection of function. So there's nothing that an architect can do that anyone else can't do. So, um, but one of the really important things that the ARB do is they regulate how architects are educated. So we met with them to talk about future reforms that might happen in architectural education. This led to a sort of open consultation that the ARB ran, which we were then able to direct loads of people towards to give feedback on um, you know, the, the willingness that architectural workers had for a more sort of equitable um, process of education where you didn't have to get 100,000 pounds of debt to become an architect, this kind of thing. This led to ARB um, from that consultation uh, they sort of synthesized all of that feedback into proposals for what they called the most significant changes to architectural education and training in 50 years. And um, we're now sort of about, I would say, 75% of the way through that uh, reform process where we should be seeing this new form of education being implemented later this year, hopefully. So the, these are some of the things that we've done as FAF, and the kind of way that we do this, our organizing strategy and our practice, 
often is no more complicated than this. So one of the ways that we kind of communicate these issues to people, one of the ways that we critique things is through memes. And you know, you might look at this and think, well that's very lowbrow, that's very juvenile. And I would say, yes it is, and that's the point. The <laughs> point is that you lower the bar as much as possible so that as many people as possible can be involved and invested in the issues that you're trying to raise. So when we need to do the big serious uh, you know, open letter, we can do that. But when we're trying to get people to care about these things, we you know use the sort of language of the younger generation and the language of the internet, um, which is this. And uh, it doesn't hurt that it you know bringing humour into the organising as well also kind of makes it more bearable because it is it is hard work, so you might as well make it fun. Um, and so I know that I think you know, saw are quite significantly featured in the exhibition, so I won't go into them too much, but just to give you a bit of an overview of some of the things I'm excited about in the UK more broadly, we have UPW saw um, a architecture union that was created in, formed in 2019, so very, very young as an organization, but they've already had an incredible impact on conversations around equity, labor movement, unpaid overtime, things like this in the UK. Uh, they're still small right now, but they're sort of growing consistently, and I'm really excited to see what happens uh, with them in the future, and um, the kind of growing labor movement, not only in architecture, but also the labor movement that we see all around the world right now, from Starbucks unionizing for the first time ever, to Amazon unionizing for the first time ever, we're, we're seeing a lot of like quite significant new moments in the labor movement right now. Um, that, yeah, I, so I, I, it's great that we have a little piece of that in architecture as well. Um, and this is just kind of an example of like the ways that they're going above and beyond what a normal union does. So a normal union just represents their members and tries to improve their conditions through you know, casework and employment tribunals and things like that. Whereas, so being in architecture where people don't often realize that they even are workers, they've also taken on a sort of educational and uh, like a sort of campaigning role to bring more architects into this discussion around labor because it's often something that we are quite alienated from. Another really exciting group is the Architects Climate Action Network, which, <clears throat> again, started in 2019, but they've grown to become a sort of international movement, so I think there's a ACAN branch in Sweden now, if I'm right, um, and they're doing a lot of grassroots organising around things like embodied carbon and retrofit in the UK, they're protesting, they're lobbying um, government officials to bring in better policies on the built environment and climate. And yeah, like I said, very, very excited about what these guys are doing. And so I'm gonna kind of just end with, um, you know, maybe uh, a kind of call to political engagement, uh, not just within architecture, because in the article that Lady Hanrahan writes, it's not just about architecture. If we just focus on architecture itself, then, you know, we're gonna be paid well while perpetuating the climate crisis and making the conditions of construction workers worse, that kind of thing. So we don't need to think about just within architecture, we need to think through architecture, through our work to the larger political economy. And, you know, if it seems like something that you can't be involved with because it's just like a massive, massive challenge and no one's ever gonna listen to you, this image I think is a great way of dispelling that thought because this is four days after we created the fact account and Reva had reached out to us after we created this account and after we um, began to share this open letter. So 
there is an incredible opportunity right now, both in the wider political condition and also through the digital tools that we have access to, to really, really operate and organize in a very effective manner right now. And uh, the last thing I'll leave you with is this quote from Kevin Heron, which says, architects have to work from a political base, and if there isn't one, you have to start it.